Hello and welcome back to Math 301 Combinatorics at CSU. Today we're going to be talking about recursions. So this is the introduction to chapter six and we're starting with the Fibonacci numbers, but I wanted to talk a little bit about recursive sequences in general, what it means to define something recursively. So a recursive definition of a sequence is, consists of some initial values and a rule for getting the next entry from previous entries. So you build things up one at a time starting from initial values. Here's an example. Say we set a0 equal to 1 and a n to be 2 times a sub n minus 1 for n greater than or equal to 1. So this is the initial value and this is the recursion. So using these two statements, we can build up what the entire sequence is starting at a0. So a0 is 1. And then to get a1, we plug n equals 1 into this formula and we get that a1 is 2 times a0. Well, but we know a0 is 1, so we plug that in, we get 2. Similarly, a2 is 2 times a1, and so we get 2 times 2, which is 4. And a3 is 2 times a2, which is 8, and so on. And we see that the sequence doubles each time. And indeed, we can think of this as saying we start at 1, and then each time we double the previous number. And so we get the sequence of two powers, 1, 2, 4, 8, 16, etc. So we can see that pattern pretty easily in this example, but then we'll see more complicated recursions. Now, how do we solve a recursion? What does it mean to solve a recursion? Well, it means to find an explicit formula for what the nth term of the sequence is. This isn't always possible. Sometimes it's good enough to just have a recursion for a sequence, but sometimes it's useful to have an explicit formula, which is something that doesn't depend on previous terms. It's just a formula in terms of n. For instance, in this case where we had a0 equals 1 and a n equals 2 n a n minus 1, it looks like a sub n is 2 to the n for all n. It's the nth power of 2. And so we can prove this by induction. Uh, in general, we can prove explicit formulas for recursions by induction by starting with the base case, showing that it holds for n equals 0. And that's basically showing that it matches the initial condition, a0 equals 1. That's 2 to the 0. So the base case does hold. And then for the induction step, let k be bigger than or equal to 0, and let that be an arbitrary integer for which um, a k equals 2 to the k. And we want to show a k plus 1 is 2 to the k plus 1. Well, by the recursion, this is twice a k, the previous number, and a k is 2 times 2 to, is 2 to the k. So we get 2 times 2 to the k, which is 2 to the k plus 1, which is exactly what we wanted. So there's an example of an inductive proof that shows the explicit formula a sub n equals 2 to the n for all n. And so in general, you can do inductive proofs of this form to show that a formula satisfies a recursive definition. So now let's look at one of the most famous examples of recursions in all of mathematics, which is the Fibonacci sequence. And the textbook has a lot of examples of where the Fibonacci sequence comes up in nature and in mathematics in various uh, situations. But right now, let's just focus on the definition. So as a sequence, it's the sequence of numbers f0, f1, f2, dot, 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 where f0 is 0, f1 is 1. Those are the two initial conditions. And then uh, fn is fn minus 1 plus fn minus 2 for n greater than or equal to 2. So notice we look two steps back here. To get fn, we look at the previous two terms. So we do need two initial conditions to get us started. So if we try to write down the sequence, we start with 0 and 1. And then to get to the next step, because this is the depth 2 recursion, to get f2, we needed both f0 and f1 to be given to us to say, well, we're going to take f0 plus f1 to get f2. And in general, we, can, we always see that each number is the sum of the previous two terms. For instance, f3 is f2 plus f1 by plugging in n equals 3 into the recursion. So we get 1 plus 1, which is 2. And then f4 is the sum of the previous two numbers, 2 and 1, and that's 3 and so on. So we get this sequence 0, 1, 1, 2, 3. The next number is the previous 2, 2 plus 3 is 5, and then 3 plus 5 is 8, and so on. You always add the last two numbers of the sequence to get the next term. So that's the Fibonacci sequence, and we're going to see some properties of the Fibonacci sequence today including the explicit formula for the Fibonacci numbers, which is far more complicated looking than the 2 to the n we had in the simpler example. So it, the Binet's formula for the Fibonacci numbers says that fn is 1 over square root of 5 times 1 plus root 5 over 2 to the n minus 1 minus root 5 over 2 to the n, which is kind of crazy that this always is even an integer, let alone um, being the nth Fibonacci number. But somehow these square root of 5s always cancel when you plug in an integer for n here, um, and you'll get the nth Fibonacci number. 
So let's see why this is true, even though it's a little unmotivated right now, um, we'll see reasons why this formula has to hold, like what, what's the motivation for this formula in future sections and in future videos. But let's just prove it by strong induction right now. And we do need strong induction because the nth term depends on the previous two steps, not just on the previous step. So we do need a strong induction hypothesis. Let's start with the base cases though. We need the two base cases to show that the initial values are satisfied. Let's start at n equals zero. When we plug in zero into this formula for these exponents, anything to the zero power is one. So we just get one minus one in this parentheses, which is zero. And zero is f sub zero. So the formula does agree with f sub zero at n equals zero. Similarly, when we plug in n equals one, we get uh, one plus root five over two minus one minus root five over two. And we combine those fractions, the ones cancel and the, the, fives, the root fives add to give you two root five over two uh, over root five, and all of those factors cancel to give you one, which is F1. So again, see the root fives do actually cancel and we actually got an integer. Um, so why does this hold in general? Well, let's do the induction step now. So now that we have these two base cases, let's let K be bigger than or equal to one and assume that for all J between zero and K, then at the FJ satisfies this recursion. So this is our strong induction hypothesis. And, uh, and now, now that we have those two base cases to start, now if we're doing say f sub two, that's in terms of f zero and f one, and in general, any fk is, uh, can be expressed as the sum of the previous two. And we know that by our strong induction assumption, the, um, the formula holds for both fk and fk minus one. So we can plug in that formula for f sub k and for f sub k minus one, just by putting the k and k minus one in these exponents. And now we wanna simplify this and try to show that it's the formula for k plus one. So in order to combine these two terms with the one plus root five over two is let's factor a one plus root five over two out of the one plus root five over two to the k power. So we get two um, of these numbers to the k minus one power to, to combine. And similarly, we factor out a one minus root five over two from this one, so we can join these two. And so we just uh, add them. We after, out of these two terms, we combine them to get one plus root five over two plus one copies of this k minus first power and same thing for this k minus first power. And so these are three plus root five over two and three minus root five over two when we simplify the fractions. It'd be nice if this factor was one plus root five over two squared because then this k plus one, k minus one power would become k plus one, which is what we want. So let's check that this actually equals one plus five, root five over two squared. So above my head here, one plus root five over two squared is uh, one plus root five over two to, uh, sorry, one plus root five squared over four which equals one plus two root five plus five by expanding that um, binomial squared. And that's six plus two root five divided by four. And we can cancel a two in the top and bottom to get what we wanted, which is three plus root five over two. So yes, three plus root five over two actually is equal to the square that we wanted. And so we can substitute now three plus root five over two is one plus root five over two quantity squared. Similarly, three minus root five over two is one minus root five over two quantity squared. And so now we can combine these products. This is one plus root five over two to the two plus K minus one, which is K plus one. And we get a one minus root five over two to the K plus one. That's the K plus first formula. And so we've gotten that the K plus first Fibonacci number does actually satisfy that formula. And so we've proven using this long computation that actually, yes, Binet's formula does hold. So what have we done in all these proofs of showing that a recursion that an explicit formula satisfies a recursion? Well, the two steps that we've had to do to make the induction work is first the base case, which it boils down to showing that the formula has the same initial values as the recursion. And then you have to just show that the formula satisfies the recursive equation. So when you plug it into the recursion, it makes a true statement. So that's, it, it's sort of simpler than writing out the whole induction and all the steps. And so often um, we just skip the, the whole step of induction and just say, these are the two steps we need to do to show that a formula satisfies a recursion, that that matches that recursive sequence. So we're gonna use this shortcut in the future. And let's see an example of this now with an actual sequence that's defined recursively, where we're not only gonna prove an explicit formula, we're gonna make one first, where maybe we don't know the explicit formula right off the bat. So let's say we have the sequence defined by b sub zero equals zero, that's the initial value. And then b sub n is b sub n minus one plus two n minus one for all n bigger than or equal to one. So we start at zero and notice we take the previous number and we add the next odd number 
two n minus one each time to get to the next term. So we start at zero and we add one, and then we add three to get to four, and then we add five to get to four plus five is nine. And then we add seven to get to nine plus seven is 16. If we add nine, that's the next odd number, we get to 25 and so on. And you probably see a, a pattern here, zero, one, four, nine, 16, 25. These are the perfect squares. One squared, two squared, three squared, four squared, five squared, et cetera. So let's guess that b sub n is always n squared. And let's see if we can prove this, that this is an explicit formula that satisfies this recursion. So again, to prove that something satisfies a recursion, there's only two steps using our shortcut. And the proof is that, so first we do the, basically the base case of the induction, which is showing that the initial condition is satisfied. Well, for b sub zero, the zero squared is indeed zero, and that's what we want up here. And now we wanna show that this formula satisfies this recursion if we plug in b sub n equals n squared and b sub n minus one equals n minus one squared. Is that true? So let's start on the right-hand side, it's more complicated. So b sub n minus one plus two n minus one, gives you n minus one squared plus two n minus one. And if we expand out n minus one squared, we get n squared minus two n plus one. And that cancels with the two n minus one here, the two n's cancel and the ones cancel. And we just get n squared, which is b sub n. And so that's exactly what we wanted to show that when you plug these numbers into the recursion, you, you get um, what you want for b sub n. So there's a, an example of where we found the explicit formula and then we proved it by showing it, it satisfies the recursion. And now we'll see some examples where, of where this comes up in combinatorics in counting. So counting with recurrence is a very powerful tool in combinatorics where sometimes if you're, you're trying to count something, it's easier to count it in terms of previous sizes that you've counted rather than coming up with some explicit formula. For instance, say we're trying to count how many binary sequences of length n have no two consecutive ones. So two ones can't be next to each other. So here's an example where no two ones are next to each other. But here's a bad example, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 0. That's bad because these two ones are next to each other. So we're going to eliminate all those sequences and see how many are left. So let, let's let b sub n be the answer here. Well, we can actually come up with a recursive formula for b sub n by saying, in, in fact, we're gonna show that b sub n is b sub n minus one plus b sub n minus two. So very Fibonacci-like. So the, the strategy here is consider first all of the sequences of this form that end with zero. Well then, if we have any sequence of length n minus one that has no two consecutive ones, well, this zero isn't gonna ruin anything. So you can put all b n minus one possibilities there. But if it ends with one, then we have to be careful. The previous term can't be one, it has to be zero. And so it has to end with zero, one. And then the previous n minus two terms can be any of the possible b n minus two possibilities that have no two consecutive ones because this zero won't make any consecutive one with the previous um, term. So now it's every sequence is either this form or that form. So we add them up, b n minus one plus b n minus two is b n. Now for the initial values, how many of these sequences of length zero are there? Just one, the empty sequence. And how many of length two? Either zero or one. Those are both valid sequences. They don't have any two consecutive ones. So there's two of them. And so those are the initial values. And notice it's a little bit different from the Fibonacci numbers. So the Fibonacci numbers start at zero, but these one at zero and one, but these start at one and two. So if we write out this sequence, one, two, three, five, seven. So you start at one and two, and each number is the sum of the previous two. Two plus three is five, three plus five is eight, etc. It's almost the Fibonacci sequence. It's just translated by a little bit. This Fibonacci sequence just starts with zero and one back here. So there's sort of a hidden zero and one that aren't in our sequence. And if we write down the labels and, and be careful about our indexing, this is F0, F1, F2, F3, F4, F5, F6 for Fibonacci numbers, but B0 starts at this index, B0, B1, B2, B3, et cetera. So as a formula for the, for the B sequence in terms of Fibonacci numbers, we see B1 equals F3 and B2 equals F4 and B3 equals F5. So B sub N is just F sub N plus two. So it's sort of a shifted Fibonacci sequence here. Now let's see how this recursive formula can actually help us solve numerical counting questions very quickly. Say we wanted to count how many binary sequences of length eight have no two consecutive ones. Well, we have this recursion for b sub n, we wanna calculate b sub eight. And each, each bn is the sum of the previous two values. So starting at one and two, 
we can just take 1 plus 2 to get the next number, 3. So b sub 2 is 3. And then b sub 3 is going to be 2, 3 plus 2, which is 5. So we need to calculate b0, b1, b2, b3, which is 5. And then b4 is 8. And then, see, we get the Fibonacci numbers coming out here. 8 plus 5 is 13. 13 plus 8 is 21. 21 plus 13 is 34. And 34 plus 21 is 55. And we're done. So all we had to do was add those numbers a bunch of times, and we get 55. And counting all 55 of these sequences that have no two consecutive ones without this recursion would be very tedious, and there would be a lot of casework. And so this actually saves us a lot of work in a combinatorics problem. In fact, computers can generate many terms of this sequence extremely fast. So recursions, if you can find them, are a very powerful counting tool. Now let's look at some identities satisfied by these famous Fibonacci numbers. So this is the content of section 6.1. There's a lot of these identities at the end of the section that are really fun to prove. So I just want to do one example here to show you how we can use induction to prove things about recursive sequences using the recursion. So let's prove that for all n greater than or equal to 0, the sum of the first n Fibonacci numbers, f0 plus f1 up to fn, is fn plus 2 minus 1. So let's prove this by induction. So the base case is if n equals 0, f0 equals 0, and that's, um, and, and that's equal to 1 minus 1, which is f2 minus 1, because f2, you can calculate, is 1. And now for the induction step, let's let k be bigger than or equal to 0 and assume f0 plus f1 up to fk is fk plus 2 minus 1. And now we want to show this is true for fk plus, for k plus 1. So if we add k plus 1 to both sides of this equation, we get the sum of f0 up to fk plus 1 is fk plus 2 minus 1 plus fk, which let's put that in the middle here. And then the sum of these two numbers, fk plus 2 plus fk plus 1, are the sum of two consecutive Fibonacci numbers, which is the next Fibonacci number by the recursion, fk plus 3. So and fk plus 3 can also be written as fk plus 1 plus 2. So that, so that means plugging in k plus 1 into this formula um, we've gotten the formula that the statement holds for k plus 1 using that the statement holds for k. And so, uh, so that completes the induction. So now you try um, working with a recursive sequence. Let's consider the slightly modified sequence defined by a0 equals 2, a1 equals 1, and a sub n is a sub n minus 1 plus 2 a sub n mi minus 2. So a little bit of a variation on the Fibonacci sequence. So write out the first eight terms of this sequence. And if you do, you might see the pattern that a sub n equals 2 to the n plus minus 1 to the n for all n. And, and then the question is, can you prove this by showing that this satisfies the two initial conditions and the recursion? So that's all for today, and we'll see you next time.